Hello and welcome to the Blockchain and Us, where pioneers and thought leaders talk about their journey in blockchain technology, crypto assets, and the token economy. And I'm your host, Manuel Staggers. This episode has support from my very own The Blockchain and Us newsletter. Get an email from me every two weeks with a very short summary of new podcast episodes so you can immediately pick those interviews you'd like to listen to. To stay up to date, just visit www.theblockchainandus.com and sign up today. My guest today is Monty Monfort. Monty is an MC, panelist, moderator, interviewer, and speaker in the blockchain space. He writes for his own blog and several other media outlets, for example, The Telegraph, TechCrunch, The Economist, BBC Future, or The Huffington Post. And he also runs Mob76, a tech consultancy that works with clients to become investable and prepares them for exit. And now to the conversation with Monty Monfort. Hi, Monty, and many thanks for taking time today. Thanks for inviting me. I'm looking forward to a good conversation. Monty, we were both at a, at a blockchain conference in Malta last week at the Malta Blockchain Summit. Um, what was your impression of that conference? Um, I know the founder very well. He's a really good guy, Mario. Um, and he asked me a few months ago if, I was, uh, if I'd like to come uh, and host a couple of sessions, as I do a lot of moderating and interviewing and some keynote speaking. Um, and so I presumed it was going to be a small event because he only had three months to start it from scratch. Um, so I was utterly surprised when I realized that this guy must be a genius because he managed to get 8,500 people into uh, a hotel within the space of three months. And uh, so I, was, I was expecting a smaller event. I was expecting a blockchain-focused event but got more like a crypto event, if you know what I mean, the slightly different things. Um, I mean, I had some, obviously had some great opportunities. I spent a lot of time with John Mac McAfee uh, after um, being introduced to him because we were going on stage the following day. Uh, then, on his pri then on a private yacht with all the stuff that you can imagine that that involves with. All right, yeah, we briefly spoke about that when you escaped that party yeah well it's just crazy stuff you know but i mean it was just a it was an extraordinarily well organized event um, the only thing i would say is that you know it was almost impossible to get on the lift i was staying on the 11th floor mm, yeah this is, uh, this is a bit of a first world problem yeah no i have to say i was also positively surprised i mean first by the by the crowd that turned out but also i had some really good uh, conversations you know next to next to the things that went on on stage i mean you you already mentioned you interviewed uh, mcafee there um but then i saw you you tweeted i interviewed john mcafee in malta it's probably the end of my career <laughs> <laughs> yeah well i think there's a woody allen film called zelig so for your audience zelig becomes the person he is talking to, mm -hmm. you know, it's like a chameleon. <laughs> I presume, I, I, you know, I figured that if it's McAfee, you can't just make it a boring conversation. And I uh, bringing the other guy into the uh, conversation, there were three of us on stage. I offered the audience the chance to ask the other guy a question and no one put their hand up. Uh, so I, I kind of turned on the audience in a slightly fun way. And I got uh, a question from the cameraman. <laughs> yeah, that question. was great. I saw that. Uh, but the, I was sitting so far away, so I couldn't ask any questions. No, absolutely. To my defense. Uh, I saw him afterwards and said, listen, mate, thanks. I'll buy you a beer. Thank you very much for uh, for saving the session. And he asked me, "Is there any, we've been making an IC, ICO movie the last two years, the ups and downs, and it would be great if we could get some time with John. Uh, and I said, well, listen, I'll see what I can do. You know, bearing in mind these things, he probably was overwhelmed with suggestions. But his wife got back to me pretty quickly. Um I got in touch with them. Uh, we went up to his presidential suite at quarter to five that evening. Uh, his security asked me, and I said, I vouch for these guys, etc. His bodyguards were good people, actually. Um, and then he spent 20 minutes with this film crew, asked, answering any question they liked. Uh, so through that guy asking that question in the audience, he looks like he's managed to finish, finish his movie. Cool. So there's, that's karma. Yeah, <laughs> it's definitely worth to stick one's neck out once in a while. Absolutely. So, but, um, you know, from hanging out with, with McAfee also, maybe, was there anything that struck you as especially insightful? Well, 
I think I don't know if you've seen the film O Gringo or El Gringo on Netflix. It paints a picture of like a crazy person. Yeah. Um, but I have to say that the people that I met, at, well, the conversations I had with him were of a high intellectual nature. Um, his wife is absolutely charming. Uh, she kind of manages his schedule. Um, I saw some evidence of, you know, some pretty hardcore whiskey, uh, but none of the other stuff that you'd imagine. And, you know, I think when we said goodbye to each other, he said to me, thanks for the heroin. So, you know, clearly I didn't supply him with any heroin, but I think that's just the way he is. I mean, he's very good at using the media and, you know, mm -hmm. casts himself as a mis mischievous person. Clearly a, a, a highly in intelligent person. So I don't know. I, I don't know. I think he's making a name for himself. He's reinventing himself. Um, and I thoroughly enjoyed the company of uh, his team, and uh, not least him. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. Insights. Well, I, I don't know. I think he's a libertarian and doesn't trust many people, um, which is fair enough. Uh, and, you know, I suppose the crypto blockchain industry needs a star, and it looks like he may be that star. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for some people, I think definitely, definitely uh, he is. Um, do you think that conference there was a pretty good picture of the current state of blockchain technology? Yeah, I would say so. I think that I think I think they probably real, didn't realize they had such a monster on their hands. So I think there's a there's a famous Apple um, uh, missive that you know we only have ten minute meetings. No one listens after that. So I think they may have got that idea uh, to have like 10, 15 minute slots um, and keep all the sponsors happy, I suppose, as well. But I mean, I was on stage with McAvee and, and uh, Brendan from Skycoid for 15 minutes, and, and everyone said, you know, we could have had that go on for another half an hour at least. So, uh, so I'd say there was, I'd say there were a number of sessions that kind of laid out the state of play and where we're at. Um, but as for really in-depth, focused speeches and conversations and panels, I think that suffers a little bit. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I'm sure you also walked around at the exhibition. And I mean, many of these projects just looked so, what's the good word? Yeah. Just like there was very little behind them, to be honest. Well, I think the thing that struck me most of all was that, I mean, I've been to conferences for 20 years. And um, I mean, I went to Money 2020 which is fintech um, fintech event in Amsterdam in April, March or something. And um, I went on a barge afterwards um, and there was a white owl and a bald eagle on the, on the barge hmm. and untold bottles of champagne, etc. That just reminded me at the, the beginning of Mobile World Congress and all those type of places where there was so much money around. Um, and I think I saw, I mean, I saw a lot of people with a lot of money doing, spending a lot of money. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And and the people breaking down doors to get in, I think there's a lot of people that couldn't get in to see McAfee. And it, it really, I think there's been a bit of a dip in the kind of crypto industry since the kind of fall of Bitcoin and Ether and other currencies. But I, I, I'm definitely feeling as if like the good times are back. I mean, the amount of excess display on that show is a pretty good yardstick for what goes on at most crypto conferences. So it's a gold rush, you know. And as you said, you know, the, the vapor where you've got to try and work out the gold from the vapor. Mm -hmm. Not easy. Right. It's not easy when something is so new. You've yeah. Lots of people with big dreams, great ideas, even big funding. Mm -hmm. Okay. Cool. Um, you also have um, a technology advisory company next to your work as a, as a writer, right, for several outlets. But uh, I'd like to speak a little bit about this uh, advisory that you're doing for clients there. So you're also uh, working with companies in the blockchain space. Yeah, it's not as tech based. I mean, I'm, I have a very, very, very strong network, in my opinion, uh, of fine people that I've spent years trying to to build up. So when someone's trying to find some funding, I'm pretty good at matching people. So I match people, uh, let them kind of collide, and then I pick up some spare change uh, <laughs> via that. <laughs> I'm kind of getting old. I think there's a phrase that I said a couple of years ago. It's like when you're in your 20s, you're in the industry. Uh, when you're new to the industry, 
when mm-hmm. you're in the 30s, you're in the industry. When you're in the 40s, you're an industry veteran. And when you're in the 50s, uh, you're an industry legend. Okay. The fact that I've, I don't feel my age is just ridiculous. Um, but, you know, you build up a network. I think there's a story of Picasso. He was painting near Nice when he was the most famous man in the world before the Second World War. Uh, an American saw him painting or sketching a picture at the Columbia or a restaurant in the mountains over Nice and thought, oh, my God, you know, this is like the, I'm going to be able to get the bargain of all time. And, um, you know, it goes up the guy, who finishes the sketch, the guy comes over and he says, um, uh, like, you know, amazing, I'd love to buy your sketch if that's possible. And Picasso said, sure, no worries. And he said, how much? Expecting a low price. Picasso said $50,000. Well done. What are you talking about? You're mad. It's only taking you 15 minutes. He said, you're not paying for the 15 minutes. You're paying for the 50 years that it took me to, mm. to do this in 15 minutes. Yeah. So that's how I provide that type of concierge service. That I'm, you know, I'm quite expensive, but and it doesn't cost me to introduce me to two people. But in, a, in an environment where writing pays so little, uh, you have to be a bit clever with what you're doing. So... Uh, I mean, these things have to be mutually exclusive, obviously. Um, but yeah, so there's that. There's just like you talk about identity politics. It's like I've got a kind of in, in identity career where I pick a bit of here and a bit of there. There's a bit of writing here, and there's a bit of consultancy there. Then there's a bit of speaking here, and a bit of moderation there, and a bit of introduction there, and a bit of did biz dev there. That's it's just pretty modern. A lot of people that I know live like that. Mm-hmm. I mean, you said you work mostly with, with clients in the tech space, and obviously blockchain clients are a subset of that. But is there a difference in your process when you work with a company in the blockchain space? I think you have to get some... Uh, I think everything's hot. So if you can help a company raise money, um, you know, it's going to be easier maybe in the blockchain space. But you also have to be responsible to what you're doing. You know, you, you can't just think, oh, great, there's quite a lot of money in that for me if I you know, if I do that. You've got to be a bit more responsible. And as you said before about the filter and the vapor and being able to go from one to the other and, and know what is gold and what is just kind of coal, um, I think it's, it's very, very important that you that you do the same, you know. So mm-hmm. You have to pick your clients as much as they, as much as they pick you. Yeah, pick them and fire them too. <laughs> Sometimes, how do you how do you go about making sure that uh, clients are for real, especially when they're in the crypto or blockchain space? Well, you generally get—I mean, it's not anything else. You generally get a taste of the founder or the team, the talent, the products, and the idea. I mean, it's no different to any other form of business. You know, if you believe in the people and you believe in the idea and you believe in the product, then you know. I'm happy to make those introductions. Cool. Do you also help those clients tell their story, tell their story, what, what they're doing? Well, I've got, I've got a reasonable story about that. If I, I mean, I write regularly for the BBC, weekly for Forbes as a contributor. Um, and I've written for Tech, TechCrunch and Matchable and Newsweek and MIT Tech Review. And most of these uh, processes um I send in a you know bullet points and I send in this that and I've got access to the CEO blah blah blah. If I pitch to the Economist, they have to I, I can only get the, the 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 pitch if I give them the story in thirty five words. Mm. And I think that's something that blockchain companies could spend some time on doing. Instead of you know giving you like six page term sheets and summaries and. Investor decks, you know, let just get it not a mission statement more than that, something that you know it defines what the story is. What is your story? You know, 35 words is tough for anyone, but what is your story in 50 or 60 words? What are you trying to do? You know, it's 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 tough, but that's what you should do. Mm-hmm. What's a good example of that that you've seen recently? Oh, blimey. Um, you caught me off. <laughs> and it's been a long day. Um, and I, I can't think of anything immediate. I mean, you obviously have to think about that too, right? When you have an idea for a story, you want to pitch it and you have to condense it. How do you go about this and how should entrepreneurs go about this when they want to sharpen their story? Well, it's like anything else. You know, it's 
you've got to have advice. You need to have mentors, mentors on board. You have to have the incipients of a board. You know, you have to have the beginning of a board, even though you're on a young stage. Mm -hmm. You've got to have good people around you. And you may be two 22-year-old geni, you know, that have a fantastic idea. I've been working in the blockchain space for five years. I've made some crypto investments, etc. You know, that's all very well. I mean, I will probably never know ever as much as they do, you know. But you can't just do that on your own. You need to surround yourself with good people. It's like, you know, it's like in life as a person. If you have a kind of Plato's cave where everyone believes in the same way as you and every time that someone waves their hand, you see the same shadow, um, it's not good for anyone. You need, to, you need to know so many different types of people, whether they're young or old or they're a plumber or they're a technologist or they're a builder or a lawyer or they're young or they're old or, or, or anything. I mean, that's what real diversity is, right? You know, it's not just about race and color and gender or, you know, uh, anything like that. It is, I suppose, but it's, it's, it's like everything else. You need a, a wide variety of sources to hone your product and to, uh, to, to improve. Let's take a quick break for a message from our sponsors. This episode has support from my very own The Blockchain and Us newsletter. Get an email from me every two weeks with a very short summary of new podcast episodes so you can immediately pick those interviews you'd like to listen to. To stay up to date, just visit www.theblockchainandus.com and sign up today. To hone your product and to uh, to, to improve. Mm -hmm. Yeah, cool. And for that, obviously, you need to be in the right place. And you're in London currently, right? That's yeah, based. London is kind of always going to be London, right? It's awesome. It's, right. it's the best city in the world by far. Um, I know it very well from, you know, I used to be a, a motorcyclist um, dispatch rider in London for probably 12 winters over a 15-year period. So I know, you know, little nooks and crannies and small places to go. Nowadays, I know a little bit more about, um, you know, about what's happening next especially uh, when it comes to technology and that terrible six letter word called Brexit, which is, which is the longest suicide note in history. I am seeing a lot, a lot of money leaving uh, the UK at the moment and a lot of jobs going and a lack, you know, and we have a very good fintech sector. I, I think the blockchain part of, of, of London's tech scene is still to mature. But uh, any, you know, fintech company is, you know, Bitcoin has pro proven that you can build a business in a different way. Mm, yeah. Are most of your clients, have they been from London or are they still from London? All over, all over the place. What is, what kind of differences do you see between, you know, countries like the UK or, or America or Asia? Well, it depends on the sector. I don't, I don't think we're... Well, well, in the blockchain crypto okay, space. Well, yeah, I mean... I think Asia's ahead when it comes to, to trading. Um, I think obviously Japan and Korea are hugely active. I mean, I'm looking at it in a very long-term way that this is, you know, crypto assets or cryptocurrencies are not something that you invest in as a speculative tool. It's something that you use um, in your everyday life. And I think people don't really realize how, how easy it is to spend Bitcoin or Ether when it comes to, to stuff, I suppose. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, we're living in a global connected world. Um, Asia's ahead. America, I think uh, I, there weren't many Americans in Malta, but there were some. Um, and I think, you know, like anything else, you can't, you can ne I think the, I would say Europe is ahead when it comes to the blockchain space rather than North America. But at the same time, you know, Americans are quick to seize an opportunity. I can see them making a big push next year. Mm -hmm. I've heard that too, that somebody said um, America could just allow all of this and then it would be game over for everybody else. I think there's enough to go around. I mean, because I write for so many different um, publications, I generally get a kind of preview of what's going to happen next because of the releases and the information that I receive. Um, and at the moment, uh, I have never seen anything any ecosystem appear and change so much as I have done in the last year and a half. 
absolutely amazing how quickly it's happening, how people are kind of converting their businesses. And you talk about kind of digital transformation, this much overused phrase when I don't think you, you can just take the word digital out now. Transformation. This transformation is out of this world. I mean, it's <laughs> it's it's incredible. The, you know, the, the front page story is that, you know, Bitcoin's gone down 75% and all of the other things and it's terrorists and it's drug dealers and it's money laundering and they should be taxed and all this stuff. But the reality underneath it, the infrastructure is, is almost like, it's almost like a, what's that game that everyone used to play? Um, not what, what did everyone play before Fortnite? Kids used to play the building blocks game. Minecraft. Yeah, it's like a Minecraftism of the whole thing. It's just building and building and building. It's extreme. Yeah. Extreme. In 2018, what makes a tech company valuable? People always, talent always, uh, reality, uh, lack of bullshit. Mm. Um <laughs> Well, you don't. I mean, you've been there before. Um, yeah, but I think it's always down to the ideas and the talent and the creativity. And with the rise of AI, I think those are qualities are going to be more important in the future. You know, I mm -hmm. can't be creative, we can. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Which ideas do you think, um, I mean, not only in the blockchain space, also in, in tech, maybe more generally, but which, which ideas do you think fill the most urgent demand? Well, I think tech for good would be one thing, right? You know, that's what we're that's what we should be using it for. We've got a a polluted when well, we've got a polluted internet in many respects, um, a polluted planet with plastic everywhere. I mean, we should all be we should all be doing that, saving the planet. Uh, and sometimes, you know, a great idea. I mean, Facebook is a great idea, as is Google, but I don't know how much they're doing to save the planet. <laughs> Yeah, not much probably. And in the blockchain space, what what do you think there is interesting at at the moment? I think clearly financial transactions were always going to be the first kind of beneficiary of um, blockchain. But I think I mean shipping is one thing that I think is highly interesting. If you can manage different processes, different you know supply chains, different ports, different languages. Shipping will be one of the first places where bureaucracy and complication is made easier by blockchain. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. What was there something that um, in your work, you know, with uh, with your advisory, was there something in the blockchain space that surprised you that somebody did? I think there's. Well, I suppose I don't know if you know the phrase blockchain washing. Do you know that? Well, it's just when you have an existing product and then you just put blockchain on the front of it. Right, like the blockchain iced tea thing. Yeah, that then one. people. I mean, yeah, that, exactly. That's that's the that's the you know, it's a slightly overused story. Mm -hmm. that, the one that's correct. Yeah, so you know, it's like if it's. I think there's also a, a you know there is going to be, at the moment. I mean, I was the victim of a crypto crypto theft about a month, four or five weeks ago. Oh, uh, sorry to hear. Yeah, I'm still trying to get it back via hmm. some various agencies. But as you know, you know, a blockchain transaction cannot be reversed. Um, but there doesn't seem to be a system in place where, you know, these guys or girls or whatever had taken my money and they'd taken it to a completely new account. And it had been there for 13 days. You know, and we're told the wallet, you know, you know, we were able to put an alert on it. That was all we could do. We couldn't put a flag on it saying, do not touch this. Um, And then when it was taken to an exchange, um, there's this torturous process of that you have to report it to the police. I don't think there's a police officer in my country who would understand, you know, what happened. I mean, they don't. They're, they're not kind of particularly. You mentioned that there also McAfee, I think, had a hack. Yeah. How how did it how did it happen? I mean, well, do you know where the the kind of weak link was? There somehow I must have got my um, my private key. I don't know how I could have done that. You know, written down. I, I may have been naive. I had it. I had it on my computer, kind of in a file um, that I had. I, I had encrypted. Um, but maybe there's sophisticated kind of malware that did it that way. I, I have no idea. I mean, the idea of you know putting your your cryptocurrency in a crypto safe, uh, and I put it in a wallet purely because I didn't want to. Um, 
I didn't want to put it in an exchange. Mm-hmm. They've been hacked so often, you know. So in, in this respect, when I'm writing up a piece of Forbes about it at the moment, the very immutability of blockchain was a use, absolutely no use to me. There's no relationship between the wallets. There's no relation and the and the exchanges. You know, I got. A, I mean, I had a lot of people working on it for me just you know, because of the industry and mm-hmm. people that I know. But if you, this is a Binance uh, example. But you have to fill in a ticket. You know, you 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 need to block the transaction within 72 seconds. Then you get an email from um, from Binance saying that you know we'll, we'll get this done for you in 72 hours. I think that there, there, there are elements of the blockchain that are going to be irritating. Mm-hmm. I think that you know, it is not a panacea for everything. It's got blockchain doesn't mean we, we have an infected internet and it might be internet 2.0. That's completely true. It might all, all exist on smart contracts in the future. But, you know, I think there will be a backlash and I'm not sure uh, if blockchain is the answer at all. You know, this what what you just mentioned there with the immutability, is this the main thing you think should change in, in the blockchain space? Absolutely. You know, I spoke to the Binance CFO, told me, you know, we should be making these things easier. It's like, well, yeah, you're telling me, man, you know what I mean? It should, there should be, you know, the, the, you know this was clearly fraud. You know, mm-hmm. was, uh, you've got to take my word for it. I'm not a liar. But but their kind of response was, if we block every transaction, then no one's want to, no one's going to want to use our exchange. Mm. You know, this isn't every transaction. I've got. I can give you kind of seven or eight, ten. Look at this. Here's a trail of. You know, this did happen, and I am telling you the truth. Yeah, crazy. Block this transaction now. You know, I've got no. I've got nowhere to go after that. If. Oh uh, no! Well, no. You know, it's filling this ticket. It'll take seventy-two hours. I mean, there should be a button on the on the page when you make a, a, a complaint before saying that this is fraudulent. You send that to the police. There should be a button afterwards that they give you a police number as soon as you press that button, and then that button should be immediately transferred to Binance. None of that's in place. The rest of the infrastructure is great. Um, Auntie, I think we're almost uh, 30 minutes here, so I want to uh, let you off the hook. But what's uh, what's next for you? It's, well, it's, I, I can't believe that it's 30 minutes. Uh, I don't know. I'm going to Namibia with my family for three weeks in December. Uh, and we're going to get lost and have an adventure in the desert, miles away from blockchain. Uh, and then I'll probably do a lot of reading um, and try and work out what's next. But I am part of a team opening the London Stock Exchange on Thursday. Oh, cool. Uh, as an uh, anarchist, that's pretty much uh, really bad that I'm initiating London capitalism on uh, on Thursday at 8 a.m. In, uh, in the evening, I'm at Buckingham Palace um, for a bit. Palace. So that's quite a big day. I might just give it up after that, Manuel. <laughs> Can't get any higher. Monty, where can people find you? Yeah, I have a I have a kind of blog uh, called Mob Seventy Six. That's M O B, and then the numerals Seven Six Outlook dot com. M O B Seven Six Outlook dot com. Mob Seventy Six Outlook dot com. And I'm on all social networks. Monty Mumford is pretty much, you know, I've, I've written so much over the years. You can't miss me if you know. What I mean. <laughs> mm-hmm. Exactly. Cool. Good. Well, that was really fun. Thanks a lot no for taking time for this. I really appreciate it. Many thanks. Great. It's good to meet you in Malta face to face. And uh, it's a pleasure meeting you. Thanks so much for joining us today. More info on our guests and our sponsors is in the show notes of this episode and on the podcast website, theblockchainandus.com. To help people find this podcast, it's important that you download, subscribe, and give it a top rating and review on iTunes or on the podcast platform of your choice. I'm Manuel Staggers, and I thank you very much for listening.